Okay, this is the first part of a series of presentations on God's existence. We will discuss some of the preliminary issues when we talk about God's existence with people. We will then discuss some of the revelatory arguments for God's existence and then talk about natural theology. As we move forward in the presentation, we will talk about some of the complaints about revelatory claims. We will talk about abduction or inference the best explanation. We also talk about science and some of the design arguments. We will also cover existential arguments for God's existence, religious experience, some of the pragmatic issues for God's existence, and then historical or revealed theology as well. Now, if you want to know there, if there is a God, my first suggestion is to go down to the local drugstore and buy a Hershey's Cookies and Cream Bar and eat it. Then you will know for sure that there is a God in the real world. All jokes aside, let's move forward here. Now, sometimes you run into people that are very busy and they will sometimes say, well, you know, God's existence doesn't impact my life. I have things to do. Or they may say, well, you know, if this makes you happy, then I'm happy for you, but I am quite happy. As if God's existence had anything to do with one's happiness or unhappiness. Whether there is a God or not has nothing to do with whether you're happy. God would still exist if you're happy or not happy. So your feelings and happiness don't make God exist. God is an objective reality. We're making an objective truth claim. And remember, facts come before how you feel about it. Now, it's not that emotions and feelings don't matter, but just remember that no matter how busy you are or how much stuff you have or how good your career is or it isn't or how good your career is or perhaps you're struggling your career, whatever life circumstances are, God either exists or he does not exist. Remember, the existence of God impacts the way we view reality. That's what we call ontology or metaphysics. That's our view of reality, the, the world around us. God's existence impacts how we view man's origins, how we got here. It impacts how we view what's wrong with the world, the human condition. God's existence impacts how we view humans and where we're headed as a human race, our destiny. God's existence impacts how we know right from wrong, morality. And God's existence impacts our study of knowledge and how we attain knowledge, which is what we call epistemology. That's the study of knowledge and how we know things and types of certainty. Now, in their book, Good Arguments, Making Your Case and Writing or Public Speaking, authors Richard Holland and Benjamin Forrest give some good reasons as to why Christians and religious believers need to do a better job of making their claims in the public square and how to give good arguments for their claims in the public square. After all, we do give good reasons or arguments for just about anything in life. Whenever we talk about who we voted for, we always give good arguments for that or else we debate about politics for hours with people. We also give good arguments or reasons for why we pick certain ethical positions or why we picked a certain school, a certain career or where we live or don't live. The point is that we give reasons and argumentation for just about anything in life. And so we should be able to do that in our faith and talking about our worldview with others, we should be able to give good reasons and good arguments for our positions and claims. Now, they define argument here as the process of giving a systematic account of reasons in support of a belief or claim. And they say, number two here, we use effective argumentation to defend our position as a reasonable option among various choices. And number three, they say claims and beliefs go hand in hand for anything you believe. You can state that belief in the form of a claim. For example, if you're sitting around with your friends one day and you're watching the Hunger Games and you suddenly yell out to your friends, well, hey, part of this movie was filmed in North Carolina. So you're making a claim here that you, sit, that you think or you believe or else you know that part of the Hunger Games is filmed in North Carolina. This communicates what you believe. I would say in most cases that when you're doing this with your friends and you may say that in front of them, they probably will not ask you for any supporting reasons for your claim. Not a huge contentious claim there that the Hunger Games is formed in North Carolina. So 
that is definitely a case of a non-contentious claim. Just like if you say it's raining outside, you probably don't need a lot of argument or support for that claim. You look out the window and say, hey, it's raining. And most people will not probably challenge you on your claim. They can just look out the window and verify what you said. However, the more contentious or divisive the claim, the more careful, well thought out, and intentional the argument must be. So some of the contentious or divisive claims like God's existence or politics or ethical issues such as abortion, same-sex marriage or global warming, those kinds of things generally take well thought out argumentation and they take time. And most people will challenge you on these issues. Now, of course, God's existence impacts our autonomy, and so many, many, many people will obviously find that to be a contentious claim. And all these other things, these polit political issues and ethical issues are devices of contentious claims as well. Now, a common complaint that comes up in some cases, sometimes people will say, well, hey, if there are strong arguments in support of God's existence, then why aren't more people particularly intelligent, well-educated people persuaded as to its truth. And we can respond by saying, if there are strong arguments in support of God's non-existence, then why aren't more people, particularly intelligent, well-educated people, persuaded as to its truth? Obviously, when it comes to God's existence, there are a variety of people that do think there is a God, and there are a variety of people who don't think there is a God, and many of them are well-educated and intelligent. So. That argument really doesn't work. It can be turned around and we can say the opposite if we need to. Now, Ronald Nash says in his book, Faith and Reason, Searching for Rational Faith, that there's a difference between arguments on one hand and personal persuasion on the other. He says, people come to their beliefs about reality and truth based upon various factors, some rational and some non-rational. And he says, just because a person is not persuaded by an argument, doesn't necessarily mean that the argument is somehow logically defective. He goes on to say that there are non-rational factors such as ignorant bias, self-interest, fear, or pride that may stand in the way of a person genuinely understanding and feeling the full force of a powerful argument and being persuaded by it. He goes on to say a person's noetic or belief-forming faculties are seldom as neutral and detached and coolly objective as many people, including especially intellectuals, would like us to think. Therefore, what he's saying is nobody is totally objective in evaluating the evidence for God's existence. Now, that does not mean evidence and argu arguments are necessarily subjective. Evidence is objective. Everybody has access to the same evidence that they will look into it. Obviously, it takes some time. However, when we go to look at the evidence, our interpretation of the evidence may be influenced by things such as bias and ignorance and worldview issues. So nobody is generally 100% objective in approaching the existence of God or looking at evidence for the existence of God. He says, and the persuasion seems to be person relative and no single argument will likely persuade everyone when it comes to the big issues, and that's true. Once again, it's not that every evidence or proof is relative. It just means that some people will be persuaded and others will not be persuaded. Proof is different from persuasion. So we need to keep that in mind when we present what we consider to be a coherent argument for God's existence and people just don't find themselves convinced. And of course, atheists say the same thing to theists. They say, I just can't believe how you cannot understand this argument against God's existence. I mean, come on, why don't you understand it? So just remember the issue of persuasion, very important. Now let's go ahead and give a definition here. A proposition can be said to only be true if it corresponds to reality. And the correspondence theory of truth is a test for truth and we live our lives by this test every day. Most of the statements we make every day have to do with making statements that correspond to reality. So if I say I am on the Oval at The Ohio State University, I'm making a claim that can be matched with reality. Or if you say I'm going to school today from 8 to 5 p.m. or I'm going to work at Arby's from 8 to 5 p.m. or Panera Bread from 8 to 5 p.m., you're making a statement that you think matches reality. It's based in the real world. 
So to show a proposition is true, one needs to be able to present arguments, evidence and arguments, a process of reasoning that can be either deductive, inductive, or abductive. We'll talk about those definitions as we go forward. So remember that the nature of the object determines how we know it, corresponds to reality, and what method we will utilize to show it corresponds to reality. So that means if you make a claim that the God of the Bible exists or that Jesus is the Son of God, what do many skeptics say? Well, there's no evidence, there's no proof. And that's because we need to first determine the nature of the object that we are trying to examine here. Is God a physical object that can be verified directly with our five senses? And how would we know what the nature of the object is? Now, when I say nature of the object, Look around your room and look around outside, look around everywhere, look all around you. And of course, many things you will be able to verify with your five senses. They have materiality, composition, and they are physical things. So it should make, it should come to no surprise that many people assume that the God of the Bible must be a physical object. He must be just like everything we see. He must be physical, material. He must have parts, composition, materiality. And then they get frustrated when you tell them that God is in a different category. He's in the unmade category. He's in the non-material category. And the reason we know that, we know the nature of the object is something that we will deal with as we move forward. Now, the next question is, does someone need to master philosophy, theology, history, and the sciences to have a relationship with God? And we would have to say no. That's why we need to bring up what's called revelatory arguments. Now, the word revelation means a disclosure, something that's been hidden and uncovering or unveiling. It's something that was not known before, and it is revealed. For example, you probably have things revealed to you all day long. People come up to you and they say, did you know this or did you know that? No, it was revealed to you. Someone told you or you read it in a book or you read it online. So obviously this model is not something that's foreign to humans. But when it comes to God's existence, revelatory arguments say that people are dead, blinded, and bound to sin. Therefore, God has to set the parameters as to how he will reveal himself to man. One way is that humans need to reason their way completely up to God. But in revelatory arguments, we believe that God must bridge the gap between us and him. He must take the initiative to reveal his plans for us, and he must come to our rescue because we are finite beings. Now, Thomas Aquinas, of course, who was a theologian, philosopher, and medieval apologist, said that if it was necessary to use a strict demonstration as the only way to reach a knowledge of the things we can know about God, very few people could ever construct such a demonstration, even those that could do it, could only do it after a long time. He went on to say, very few people possess the knowledge of God. Some do not have the disposition for philosophical study, and others do not have the time or indolent. And he's right. Many, many people do not have the time to learn and master philosophy or philosophical argumentation to find a relationship with God. Uh, that is absolutely true in reality. So just remember on a daily basis, you rely on communication, you rely on text, cell phones, email, social media, and television. You rely on your employers, your teachers to give you instructions about what you need to do. You rely on family members to communicate with you. So it's really not that far-fetched that we think that God needs to communicate with man. We need a clear message or clear revelation about the exact nature of God's character, what he is. That means what is his nature. And we need to be educated concerning the reasons for why we exist as a human race. Now, we think that God communicates through what's called natural theology. Natural theology is a practice of philosophically revealing the existence of God and nature of God without appealing to scripture or revealed theology. So that means natural theology is the opposite of number two here, which is revealed theology or history, which is based on authoritarianism. In authoritarianism, we believe God has revealed himself through a written text and it's an authority to mankind. That means God has revealed his plans or intentions for humanity through 
a written text. And the reason why we need both is because in natural theology, we learn, learn about God's metaphysical attributes, things like omniscience, omnipresence, all, and other things, whereas revealed in historical theology reveals God's character attributes, such as love, patience, long-suffering, kindness, holiness, things like that. Now, we also believe in number three here that God has chosen to reveal himself through religious experience. And that means when we take people like Muslims who are in Saudi Arabia or other parts of the world, they do not necessarily need a Bible to find out who Jesus is. God sometimes reveals himself to them through dreams and visions, through testimonies of Muslims coming to faith through visionary experiences in other parts of the world. And those are places where the Bible is not available. But in the United States, of course, the Bible is available. So the main way God reveals himself to humans is definitely through revealed theology. Of course, natural theology, too, is available to everybody, as we'll talk about. Now, if you want to get hold of some resources to discuss natural theology, you can get the Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology. Uh, the middle book here, God's Crime Scene by James Warner Wallace, does not appeal to biblical arguments at all. It deals mostly with arguments for God in nature. Of course, in that book, he's dealing a lot with abduction or inference, the best explanation, but still, it does talk about evidence for design and evidence for God in the world of nature. And then there's some arguments that go back and forth in debating Christian theism, where atheists and theists go back and forth in some of the natural theology arguments. Now, most recently, these three books have come out, well, I should say, the one on the far left, Edward Fazer's book, The Last Superstition, came out about 2008 or so, I think, or 2009. But his most recent book is Five Proofs of the Existence of God, which just came out last year. And then we have New Proofs of the Existence of God by Robert Spitzer. And he is a physicist and has a philosophical background as well. <clears throat> so if you want to go deeper on the issue of natural theology, these are some books that you can dive into. Now, in Fazer's book, by proofs for the existence of God, he is really utilizing philosophical theology and natural theology, what's called metaphysical demonstration, to show God's existence can be rationally demonstrated. Now, when he says five proofs here, he is not talking about Aquinas's five proofs, though he does talk about Aquinas in this book. So if you want to look at a book that deals with strict metaphysical demonstration for God's existence without appealing to history, or the Bible or anything, that would be a book to get. However, I will warn you, you do need some philosophical training or you need to at least be able to take the time to be able to read through this book because it is a bit sophisticated. <clears throat> now, some of the well-known thinkers that contributed to natural theology were Plato, Aristotle, Aquinas, and Duns Scotus. Obviously, they made major contributions to natural theology. Also, people like David Hume, John Locke, uh, Berkeley, and others also made uh, arguments in the realm of natural theology. They also made arguments against theism without making any appeal to biblical theology. You can read about that more. Now, Antony Flew was an atheist who became some sort of deist or theist later in life. And we know that his paper, Theology and Falsification, was presented at a meeting of the Oxford Socratic Club chaired by C.S. Lewis. He was a very well-known philo uh, philosopher who wrote a lot about atheism. And at the very end of his life, or towards the end of his life, as I said, he left atheism for some sort of general theism or deism. To the best of our understanding, he did not become a biblical theist or a follower of Jesus. But he left atheism mostly because of arguments from natural theology. He did not uh, leave his atheism over biblical theology, but mostly over arguments for God in design, uh, design arguments and God in nature. And then finally, a popular level book that deals with arguments in natural theology or arguments for God in the world of nature. Are, or is The Case for a Creator by Lee Strobel. That is a book where he interviews several authors and gives a counterarguments about things such as the origin of the universe, fine-tuning arguments, uh, consciousness, free will, uh, biological information, other topics. So that's a really good introduction. And like I said, he does give the counterarguments in that book. So 
I recommend that if you want an intro to this, this topic as well. So remember, God is known through the world of nature. That means that people do not need a Bible to know there is a creator. All people groups across all cultures and various time periods have always believed in some sort of creator. But if we want to know more about that creator and what his character is like and what he intends for humanity, that's where we would argue for what's called historical theology, revealed theology, where he reveals himself in a written text. And now some people will say, well, what about the Quran or the Book of Mormon or other religious texts? That is why we have historical apologetics, and that is why we can look at evidence for each of these texts and ask whether each one is really a true revelation from God or whether they all contradict, which they do, and we can evaluate the arguments for each text and come to the best conclusion. So we'll pick this up next time in part two. Have a good day.